Um, so we, when we were talking around what I might talk about, we kind of said, well, you know, what's going on with both the Cancer Society and with, with research in general? So that's what we're going to try and, and I guess, get across, uh, and perhaps a little bit about um, where I think we need to move forward uh, in, into the future. Um, as, we, as Jennifer said, I'm, I'm, I'm a lab rat. I come from that side of, of things, but I have worked uh, quite a lot uh, with clinical colleagues as well, um, the social media side as well, if you're interested in following what we do and, and, and so on. So just a little bit about the Cancer Society um, to start, and particularly my, my role and the, and the research role. Uh, we have a team of four people that oversee uh, our research. Um, so it's, it's relatively small, um, but we are far and away the largest funder of cancer research um, in Ireland, Cer certainly the largest non-governmental, um, and even by government standards, um, we, we would probably match uh, the state investment in research, unfortunately. Um, we basically, what is, what is our role? We provide the best uh, research for Irish cancer patients and best in a couple of different ways. Best in terms of us trying to prioritise and prioritise impact, um, but also in terms of quality. Uh, everything we do, we get internationally peer reviewed. So I don't make the decisions. Um, we simply try and decide where our calls might be, the scale of those calls, and then we leave it up to experts to, to work that out. Um, a, a big element of what we do, although it's not really costed, is trying to support the research community as well. So trying to make sure it's properly networked, uh, properly resourced, that we advocate um, for the research community as well. In Ireland, um, that's an uphill task because as a society, we don't fully uh, appreciate the importance of health, health care and health research. I think we're seeing the impact of that uh, in a number of our challenges in, in our health system at the minute. So our priorities, um, and this is I try to sort of explain from a lay audience, is that through research we want to ensure that Irish patients have least risk of getting cancer. So there's a, an important prevention um, message there. Best treatment if they do, um, and we're very involved, you'll see, in, in clinical trial research, in trying to bring forward new diagnostics, new therapies, and so on. Um, and increasingly, most hope of thriving afterwards, and I want to spend a bit of time on that um, towards the end. Um, I think we have to recognise that it's no longer sufficient to focus on the tumour and cure the tumour. Um, the patient is actually our focus. The tumour is an aspect of that, um, uh, so we want to try and make sure that patients get back and get back to whatever the best of health that they can uh, accomplish. And that is a significant challenge. Um, when I came in, I, I was uh, head of uh, research, and, and in January I took over as um, the head of communications, and I'll do that for about a year uh, as we replace um, that role. But I recognise that the research is probably actually the easy bit. It's the communicating the research um, and engaging our community with that research that's um, one of the most difficult things. So part of the role is around making sure that people know about that as well. Put things in scale, um, the budget of my department is around three to three million, three to three and a half million euro um, per year, and we have to try and stretch that to make it go a long way. To put that in context, Cancer Research UK's budget is um, about 500 million euro per year, and when you do the, the um, per capita, that works out at about 33, 35 million euro. So we have about a tenth of, of that, um, and that, that in itself causes real challenges. Um, so we have to try and make best impact with that. The other challenge is that goes up and down. We are absolutely dependent on income, daffodil day collections and all of that. Um, as income goes up, we can do more things. As income goes down, we have to curtail them. That's what we got hit with in January. Um, daffodil day is about 9% down um, this year, one of our biggest fundraising days. Um, and while we did great <coughs> and we got great support um, from the community for that, and that has impact, um, and we're not like a company where we can kind of predict into the future. So in terms of our longer term planning, and research needs long term planning, most of our programs are four to five years. Currently, today, um, we're directly funding 84 researchers around the country. So um, we give that money to the universities or colleges or whatever, and then they um, directly employ the people. But there are 84 people directly employed by us. There's probably two to three times that that are indirectly, that are kind of leveraged posts um, associated with that. And we also support several vital networks, doctors, nurses, scientists, and, and clinical trials professionals, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of background on that. The funding that we have means that in any, any given call, there's about a 10% success rate. Um, and when I say 10% six, success rate, that's actually when we get the um, experts to look over the applications. The ones that they say are fundable, we fund 10% of the ones that are fundable, not of all the applications that come in. Uh, and again, that's a, a significant challenge for us. <coughs> 
just to give you a bit of um, background on, on the kinds of investments this year um, that we're, we're putting in, um, and I've kind of color coded these. Is that coming up? It is, yeah. So the kind of the top ones there are sort of greeny color. Um, they're sort of in the cancer prevention space. I'm very excited by one here because we're getting a, a lot of leverage out of this. Um, basically comes from an idea which you'll not be familiar with. The things that increase your risk of cancer also increase your risk of diabetes, heart conditions, um, dementia, etc. So why don't we all work together in a prevention thing? So we're doing that. Um, and with the support of the M uh, MRCG and Health Research Board, HR HRB will put in um, and will double the money. So we hope to get a program started. We'll know in June uh, whether it's successful or not. It'll probably kick off around September, all going well. Um, we also invest uh, a lot, you'll see in a minute, in uh, networks like ICORG and in, I suppose, the biomedical model of, of, of cancer research and some of the figures, and I'll, I'll illustrate that a little bit um, in a minute. Uh, uh, as well as that, we also invest in networks like the IACR and the Irish Association for Cancer Research, and I would urge you to look at that. Um, because that, that group has tended to focus more, again, on the biomedical model and is looking to increase the, the spread of its activities. Uh, and IFCOR, which is um, in, in the um, survivorship uh, space. So that, that, looks reason sorry, that, that looks reasonably balanced, but when you look at the financial spread of what we do, the orangey coloured things here are all associated with what I would call the kind of the biomedical type model. So the blood cancer network is, is clinical trials, uh, Breast Predict will we'll spend 1.6 million euros as part of a 7.5 million euro investment over five years. Uh, the John Fitzpatrick Fellowship, which thankfully we got external funding, so it doesn't the money is coming in from from companies um, rather than coming from our bottom line and, and ICORG. So you can see that we have a significant investment in the lab side and clinical trial side of things um, from the from the finance perspective. So where does that that go? Um, we don't invest in buildings uh, and we don't really invest in equipment, we invest in people, we invest in human capital and we could divide it in sort of four areas, direct investments in individuals, um, strategic investments in collaboration, project investments um, and we have one example of a, an international partnership but it's all human capital, it's people. So just to illustrate some of those and, and I guess the kind of scale um, and, and, and that. Um, We've a scholars program. We won't be running it this year. We've had to curtail that um, with the, the current financial challenges that we're facing. But typically, um, we would award between 120 and 130,000 euro per year for a PhD um, program for a, you know, an individual PhD. We awarded three of those in, in 2015. Um, fellowship program, we haven't run one of those in a couple of years. We have a few people still on the books, um, as it were. Uh, again, that's due to um, financial um, challenges. Um, but typically we would cost that around 70,000 per year um, because we have to pay the university overhead uh, and so on. So um, our scholars, people studying PhDs, so these are individual PhD projects all around the country uh, in different aspects. Um, some of them are in the lab side of things, but actually some of them are in the um, non-lab um, side in, in, in uh, different aspects of behaviour and, and so on. So an example of just whoops, an example of some of those sort of non-lab um, investments, because people, when they think of research, unfortunately, they do tend to think of people in white coats playing with chemicals and cancer cells and stuff like that, and even, even we do. Um, and that isn't it, the, the full um, portfolio. Um, so in the case of colorectal cancer screening, uh, a thousand, over a thousand people a year um, die um, from colorectal cancer in Ireland. Um, we know that if colorectal cancer is caught early, and often it is symptomatic relatively early, if it's caught early, um, typically it can be um, cured, um, which is a very cost-effective and obviously very effective in terms of the person's life. If caught late, um, the prognosis um, is, is difficult and, and very challenging. We have a great um, colorectal cancer screening program. It's actually very simple in how it works. Everybody um, over the, uh, at, at the appropriate age, which I think is 60, um, gets a letter automatically in the post inviting him to, to take part in the program. Um, we use the most modern test available in Ireland, the FIT test, um, and, it, and, and it works. The problem is only 40% of women and 36% of men actually engage with it. Um, so more than two thirds, um, unfortunately, don't um, take up the opportunity for, for that test. Um, and 
this research is basically looking, led by, by Nick Clark, is looking at why that's happening. And actually there's some very interesting aspects coming out of that from a behavioural um, point of view. And that is going to inform pilots around how we can try and boost that and how we can change um, our, our, our impact there and bring that up. Um, in uh, health inequalities research, um, Dr. Mikhail Molko in, in Galway, uh, she's looking at the social factors linked with health, well-being and the needs of childhood cancer survivors. Um, again, a big impact. Um, childhood cancer, particularly leukemias, is generally curable, um, but the kids are often left with very significant um, psychological and medical complications associated with treatment. So she's looking at the, the differences and the, um, the needs of, of those patients. At the higher level then, our, our fellows who uh, have a, a doctorate or a, it's an MD or, or equivalent, um, so these are focusing on, on, I guess, more advanced areas and again spread around the country. Our research collaborations, um, ICORG, uh, do all of you know of ICORG? Anybody heard of ICORG or anybody not heard of ICORG? <coughs> no, okay. Well, you're going to have to wipe your memory um, next week because ICORG is going to have a very radical um, change, a very welcome change. Uh, keep an eye out on International Clinical Trials Day on the, the 19th and the 20th of May. So the name will change. So you, you heard it here first. Don't tell anybody, but the name's going to change. But ICOR conducts about 90% of all um, clinical trials uh, in Ireland. It's an open network. Um, again, it's something that from a, a research perspective really would be great to engage more um, with, with yourselves and, and um, I guess see and make use of the, the network and resource that's there. It's a collaboration between ourselves. Um, we put about, uh, we typically put about 600,000 euro. We've, we're up, we've had to bring that down a little bit. But in total, we put about 600,000 euro a year into ICORP directly and indirectly. Um, the Health Research Board put money in, and each of the clinical trials, if they're company led, if they're a company product, um, they'll also pay for that as well. So it's a collaboration between those. Last year, over 2,000 um, patients uh, were, were put on trials, about 2,200, slightly out of date. Um, so that was studies, translational studies, questionnaires, that sort of thing, and clinical trials. So it breaks down roughly about 7% of patients were, of, of all um, invasive cancer patients, were on a translational study that might be getting blood, data, whatever. Um, and about 3% were on a clinical trial of a new drug, a new surgery, um, something uh, investigator-led. Um, 14 clinical trial centres out of eight um, uh, centres um, in, in Ireland. And ICORC has a big impact in terms of, uh, of research, giving access to new drugs and new medicines and new approaches, but also has an, uh, an economic impact. And again, you'll see some of that next week. So for example, just in named, listed, approved drugs, it saved the state 18 million euro in, in cancer drugs in the last three years. So it actually paid for itself and, and, and made a, a, a return, uh, as it were. That's not including the costs of the new drugs. And as you know, many of those cost 150 to 200,000 euro per year per patient. Um, and it does give unique access to new medicines. Strategic projects investments. Um, I prospect um, with, with a couple in the in the um, prostate cancer area, and these are done in collaboration with Movember and Movember Foundation. I prospect is just finishing up, and it's uh, kind of a biomedical uh, one. It's a, it's around looking at individualisation of decision making in um, prostate cancer treatment. So taking samples, identifying and looking for some of the markers that might help individualise treatment in there, and then trying to guide um, therapy. Uh, it's building a biobank, a very important biobank as part of that as well. Um, it's got 27 national and, and international researchers as part of the collaboration, um, led by um, really some of the top prostate cancer researchers uh, in, in the country, um, as well as a, a management system. IPCOR is kind of at the other end of the, um, the, the spectrum in terms of um, prostate cancer. So it's a uh, prostate cancer outcomes research uh, group. Um, it's uh, in its second year now, uh, and it has almost all urologists in Ireland um, taking part as part of the um, collaboration. And really it's collecting data from the patient around their experience of prostate cancer, how they fared on particular treatments, and what are the big challenges in, in, in prostate cancer. Um, and this is very kind of un unknown territory. Well, 
it, we, we know the challenges. I mean, if you talk to a prostate cancer patient, you know the challenges. But the actual quantification of that is, is actually not, hasn't really been well done uh, <coughs> and well undertaken. And IPCOR um, is collaborating internationally as well, so there'll be big um, comparisons with outcomes uh, in Australia, uh, Europe and the US. So it allows us to benchmark the outcome for our patients and identify what are the key things that, that make for improvement in the outcome for that patient. Not necessarily in, in their survival, but in their overall outcome. Um, things like continence, sexual <coughs> function, the things that are important from a patient point of view. Um, uh, again, it's a, it's a big um, whoops, again it's a big um, collaboration because we've got all of the uh, urologists, but we've also got the National Cancer Registry and the Cancer Control Program built into that and hardwired into it as well. Um, again, uh, led by a great team, um, uh, David has been um, actually a, a really very important leader, um, and urologists haven't been that involved in research um, up till now. Uh, obviously, they, you know, as part of their, their surgical training, that they may have done a little bit of research, but this is bringing in a group of people, a group of, of clinicians that haven't typically been engaged with each other in trying to uh, advance their, their, their field. Um, <coughs> our largest investment, and you saw that from the initial pie chart, is in Breast Predict, which is now in its third year. It's, a, it's our biggest, our, probably our scariest investment, to be frank, because of the amounts of money that we put into it, um, and it takes up more than half of our budget in one single program. So Breast Predict um, is, a, again, a national uh, initiative. Uh, we've awarded 7.5 million over five years. Um, we don't have that money, so we have to collect that um, every year. And again, that's a big challenge. It's quite difficult to collect for something that you're already doing. So this, this, is, a, this is a big uphill, t uphill task. But it's actually having such an impact. It brings together um, all of the um, breast cancer researchers across the country, folks that you'll know of, um, John Crown, Brian Hennessy, um, Michael Caron, and so on. Um, it's already actually, again, this is a little bit out of date. There are now up to 50 um, researchers in the group. Um, the latest results back are they've leveraged an additional 16 million euro in investment from the EU and from other, from SFI and various other um, sources. So we've kind of lit the fuse in a big way by, by putting one and a half million euro a year in, but it's bringing in multiples of that back in, in their ability to, to bring the research community together. Our most recent investment is in hematology um, in the blood cancer network. Um, <coughs> we started this in, in June last year, so it's nearly a year old now, um, although it was only really made public in, in November. We, ha we had a, a formal launch. It brings together a lot of the hematology um, research, particularly the clinical trials and research, because it's focused on phase one and phase two, so early stage clinical trial um, investment. Uh, again, it's leveraging off existing resources. There's no point in us um, investing in things, in new things, when we already have them there. This is, this is one of our mantras. We have to try and make things sustainable and make sure people are working together and collaborating together. Um, in the clinical field, that can be a challenge because people have egos and um, people have, have, have history and stuff like that. But it is the only way forward. Um, so it's a collaboration with ICORG, the National Cancer Registry, led by Michael Dwyer um, in Galway, but bringing the hematologists um, all, all across the country. And we've recently added um, another um, 100,000 euro a year to that program um, to bring in the matter and Beaumont Hospitals to make it truly national. So we've one example in the strategic partnership area. Um, you might have seen recently, we announced this award. It's gone to a Dr. Emma Allett. Uh, we announced it there about a month ago. Um, and this is a partnership with Dana Farber. Um, and it's a three-year partnership. So Emma will spend two years um, in, the, in the States advancing her career there, and then a year paid for back here in Ireland, in, in, in Trinity. And the concept is of building a, a network of, of training the next generation of research leaders because um, it doesn't happen on its own um, people have to invest individuals have to invest themselves in their own time but we as a nation have to invest in individuals if we want to make sure that the best research is, is, is ongoing in this country so um, we were fortunate in that um, it's in the name of my, my predecessor John Fitzpatrick who unfortunately passed away um, in, in post um, and we were managed to persuade two companies to part with 270,000 euro um, to underwrite that. So that was a fairly um, major uh, accomplishment. So that's where we are. That's where all the money goes. And when you put your money in, in on, on Daffodil Day and into the buckets and, and that, and I mean, we're, we're in, um, I didn't go into it, but we're investing in, in palliative research in that as well, in a small way, unfortunately, but we do invest in it. 
but where are we going? Where do we want you know, the next generation of research? And trying to kind of keep that simple, because we could go down into you know, the mechanics and talk about this cell line or, or that drug or whatever. But from a bigger picture <coughs> perspective, we need to hit cancer in a couple of different areas. We need to work out how to best reduce preventable cancers. We know that 40% of all cancers, all the cancers that you guys would deal with, 40% of them are a result of lifestyle factors, of things that people did. The other 60% are bad luck and genes uh, when, when it comes down to it. But if we could bring that total, that 40% down, um, imagine the impact on the numbers um, that, that it would have. Obviously, we need to improve treatment. There's still a lot where we don't know. Um, there's still a lot of people who unfortunately end up um, coming in front of you guys. Um, where treatment fails and, and hasn't been able to either cure their, their disease or, um, you know, they, they've progressed or whatever. And th the last one I think is particularly important, improve the management post-treatment. It's one that's been kind of neglected because we've spent decades, and if you think back to the 1950s, the Cancer Society um, started in, in 1963. Um, if you think back into the 50s and 60s, there were no treatments. Pretty much everybody who got cancer died from it. Um, they didn't talk about it, and it was often a lingering, painful death. They didn't have the kind of resource, resources and supports um, that, that, that you guys bring um, to it. And we've, we've focused, I guess, on the initial fire of cancer, um, trying to get new treatments and new drugs, but we're actually doing quite well on that, um, and patients do benefit from all of the treatments. So if, if that, and I'll talk about the numbers and impact, if that's happening, now we need to uh, adjust our focus a little bit and, and support those people as well. Um, so it's really about moving away from the tumour to a focus on the, on the patient. Just to put some numbers on things, so this year there'll be over 40,000 um, newly diagnosed cancers. It'll be well over 40,000. 40,000 is a very conservative estimate. It's probably probably will be near 43,000. That includes, you know, your your relatively um, non-worrying ones. You know, your your non-melanoma skin cancers and so on, um, which are still cancers but also well over 20,000 invasive cancers, your lung cancer, breast cancer, and so on. Um, 9,000 people um, die annually. We're keeping that number relatively stagnant at the minute because of the advent and impact of research and, and new treatments. Now, cancer, as you know, is typically diagnosed in, in, in the working week. Um, and if you do the numbers and, and divide up, what that means is that um, every three minutes of the working week, somebody gets a, a new cancer diagnosis. Every six minutes, it's the kind of scary, sit down, bring in a, um, a relative with you, and listen, we're going to do our best for you, but you know, you're going to face the ravages of surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. Um, and every hour, somebody passes away um, all around the country. Um, we know that at least one in three of us will develop cancer, and in reality, that's probably heading to one in two as we look at the projections and the numbers, because the numbers will show in Ireland a doubling in the next 25 years. This is from the National Cancer Registry report. So in 2010, they did analysis and projections on this. So if you think things are bad now, um, unless we, we, we manage to get a hold of these numbers, they're going to get a whole lot worse. And that will clearly have ramifications and implications um, for, for um, infrastructure, for manpower, and that dealing with, with those numbers. Um, so if, if you look, so they did the study in, in 2010, and then they, they basically looked at the demographics the aging of our population. They, they fed in CSO figures um, and they can uh, predict um, where people are going to, uh, you know, the, the, the approximate longevity of the population and you can work out the, the factors from that. So you can see it's going up. This, this isn't going down, it isn't curving off, it is going up, inexorably up. That didn't include the impact of obesity, the, our, our, our lack of activity and, and exercise, or the impact of alcohol. And that's very worrying as well, because we know that those are significant drivers of, of cancer, going back to that lifestyle thing. Um, part of the reason for that is, and these are NCRI figures, part of the reason for that is, um, as you guys all know, um, you tend to be more at risk of cancer as you get older. And this is the breakdown of the Irish um, population. Cancer, thankfully, is extremely rare in, in kids and in, in younger people. Um, as we get into the uh, 20s, we start to see a little bit of a, a, a spike. Um, much of that is um, cervical cancer and, and, and um, gynae cancers in, in, in younger women. Um, and that has important ramifications. HPV vaccination would eliminate that if we could get a proper effective HPV vaccination. And we face challenges in our community um, at the minute with HPV vac vaccination. 
um, the um, unfortunate negative publicity, um, which is completely <coughs> false around that vaccine, has led to a, a dramatic drop in, in vaccination rates in certain parts of the country, particularly in rural and western seaboard areas. It's probably dropped over a year 20%. Okay, so that, that, that's very worrying. Um, then, obviously, as we hit the, the 50s, uh, we noticed that the numbers go up, uh, and particularly for men. A lot of that is prostate cancer. These ones here, um, from the biomedical aspect, most of these are driven by inherent genetic um, mutations and, and, and challenges. So um, certain um, things that the genes that people are born with uh, are strong um, drivers. Um, as we move on here, we start to see the impact of ultraviolet exposure in terms of skin cancer rates and, and, and so on. But a lot of these cancers represent um, our lifestyle and the fact that we're getting older. So that's why we see those, those numbers. So it's the things that we did here that impact up here. But our numbers are increasing in terms of cancer because in general, we can expect to live to around about here. The, the longevity in Ireland uh, for both men and women now has gone over 80. Um, uh, just to, to follow on from that, longevity has increased quite dramatically over a proportionately relatively short period of time. This is from the UK, but you can see the impact in, in the mid-1800s. Um, um, the average age you could expect to live was, was early 20s. Okay? Um, live hard and die young, uh, I suppose, and, and there were a variety of reasons for that. Firstly, we're very likely to die um, a childbirth. Childbirth is obviously a very risky point, but the impact of infections, respiratory infections in particular, um, it was uh, enormous. We bring it on then, um, improvements in, in basic health care and so on. Um, at, at, the, uh, at the advent of World War II, we can see it brought it up into the 60s. And it's getting more difficult now as we get into here um, because you know, we, we've impacted a lot of the diseases, respiratory diseases or whatever. We're now into the, uh, how we impact non-communicable diseases, the heart problems, cancer, um, diabetes, etc. The very worrying thing is, you may not have seen it, but recently the Centers for Disease Control in the US showed data that for the first time in, in the US, longevity is decreasing. Okay, so the impact of lifestyle is, no, is, is greater now than the impact of the trillions of euro that have been invested in healthcare research. And again, that's very worrying because we know that Ireland tends to follow the trends of, of, of the United States. So you now in the States can expect to live shorter period, a shorter amount of time than you would have if you'd have been um, um, born um, 10 years ago. So lifestyle and environment are very important and we know these things. So in terms of smoking, um, sun is obviously very important from a skin cancer point of view. Um, and we're starting to realize the impact of other things. Um, exercise is, is really very important um, in all aspects of cancer and prevention uh, and in also helping people deal and, and recover from cancer. Obesity is um, a significant um, stimulating factor um, as well. Um, and Ireland really has some major challenges in, in some of its population with alcohol. Uh, and again, we see the impact of that in cancer and in other diseases. Um, we have, a, a, along with a lot of other European colleagues, we, we have a 12-step a, a 12, um, a 12 way of reducing your risk of cancer. So actually, the uh, ability to control that and, and the, what one needs to do is actually reasonably simple. The problem is communicating this and getting it into the people that most um, need to know about it. So the numbers of people getting cancer are increasing. It's a growth industry, um, for, for want of a better expression. Uh, age, lifestyle, we are, we're more aware of cancer and there's no question that some of our new diagnostics, particularly in areas like breast and prostate cancer, have found cancers that probably in the past wouldn't have been detected, but probably wouldn't have, have led to the person's death. Um, so we, we're, we're picking up more cancers, and a small percentage of those would be cancers that probably wouldn't have um, ever caused a problem, but we're picking them up anyway. And we talk about it a lot more. It's in the media a lot more on that as well. Now, part of the challenge is the cost of cancer treatment is, is escalating very substantially. Uh, in 2009, 20, 2009, um, which is the latest um, data you get figures on, Ireland spent over one and a half billion, or nearly 1% of gross domestic, domestic product, on um, cancer treatment. That's getting uh, to be a much bigger challenge um, because in, in some areas, and as you know, cancer treatment is individualizing and becoming more personalized. We're getting better at, at focusing our diagnostics and our treatments. 
But the problem is those <coughs> treatments are rocketing and um, in some cases they've gone up a thousand fold in terms of the cost of the drug. And this is just one example of a raft of new drugs that are coming down the line. $178,000 a euro, it's a big cost. Um, uh, and if many of these drugs, where they are effective, and not all of them are as effective as the manufacturers might claim, but where they are effective, they turn cancer into a chronic disease. So that's an annual cost. It's not a cure cost. It's not a you know once off or whatever. That's a cost that keeps recurring um, to keep that per person alive. Um, last year, if we look at the FDA, um, their, their figures, they um, uh, approved uh, 45 um, new drugs. So if you just look over at this one here, 15, so a third of those drugs were specifically cancer um, treating drugs. Cancer is a big focus. So the costs are rising um, in, in, in these areas just for the drug costs alone. So cancer um, incidence and, and cancer numbers are continuing to rise and will r rise into the future. Treatment can be effective, um, and again, I'll show you some numbers on that in a minute. Um, but unfortunately, the costs of per patient treatment are skyrocketing. And that's, that leads to an inexorable <coughs> conclusion that really we will not treat ourselves out of this epidemic of cancer. We simply haven't got enough economic resources to be able to provide. And we are going to hit a real problem. We already highlighted some of the challenges and the disparities between the public and private healthcare system in, in Ireland. But we face a real problem, and particularly if you think about the impact of other diseases, um, other non-communicable diseases as well, because we've just focused on, on cancer. So research has made a big impact and continues to make an impact. I, I spoke about when the Cancer Society was set up and, and uh, the fact that really um, cancer in, in those days was typically a death sentence. When we look at the um, impact of, of research and changes in, in what we do and how we approach, we can see dramatic impacts over a relatively short period of time. So these are the NCRI statistics. And if we focus particularly on men, um, we see that the, these are the five-year survival. Um, back in the mid to late 90s, 40% of men were alive um, five years after a cancer diagnosis. Um, the latest statistics, which they're always three to five years um, behind, show that has risen to nearly 60%. That's, that's a 20%, a 50% 50, 50 overall um, increase in, in five-year survival. That's an enormous and very dramatic um, impact. So in total, when you talk to the cancer registry, 54% of all patients now are cured of their disease. So uh, cure is a kind of a relevant term, but if we take it as 10 years after their, their diagnosis, they're, they're alive and well. In the case of children, 90% of, of childhood leukemias are cured um, through the, the treatment and resources um, focused in, in, in Crumlin. And 70% of those kids, 7 in 10 of them, are actually on a clinical trial because of the, of the, the, the mechanics. So research makes and is making a, a big impact. What this means, the cancer registry figures show about 125,000 cancer survivors. But when you talk to them privately, that, that only goes from when they started collecting figures. So there's actually near 170,000, which is roughly the population of Cork, people who've been through a cancer diagnosis and been through treatment and are on the other side of it and, and living with the ramifications of that. Now, what is the reality of that? So that, that figure sounds absolutely fantastic. And to present that to a patient is say, oh, you know, I don't really need to be that worried about cancer. I, you know, I've, I've, I've a more than 50% chance of being cured. And even if I'm not cured, I've got some really great treatments out there. But what's, what's the actual reality on the ground? And this is research from um, Macmillan in the UK. So in the UK, there's about 2 million um, cancer survivors, roughly. So if you just look at the, the red box there that I focus on, they say at least um, 500,000. So one in four of survivors in the UK, and our systems are quite similar, so they're quite comparable, are disabled as a result of the cancer or the cancer treatment. So they're not able to get back to work. They have significant relationship problems, family problems, um, psychological problems. They'll have maybe um, fatigue, um, chronic fatigue, not be able to do normal everyday functions, uh, mental health issues, sexual issues, sexual function chronic pain and a variety of other medical issues. Um, that's, a, that's a fairly stark um, figure you know, in comparison. There are big economic ramifications of cancer as well. We did a, a, a study um, last year uh, on the, the cost of cancer and the typical patient is nearly 900 euro out of pocket in extra expenses. So these are things that are not covered by medical cards. These are parking charges, food, heating, all of those other um, things. Um, and they're 1,400 1, euro out of pocket in terms of loss of salary. So they're nearly 2,300 euro a month, a month out of pocket as a result of, of, of their cancer. 
typical adult cancer treatment is, is six months or, or, or maybe longer. So think of the ramifications um, of that. So one in four are disabled in some way following their treatment. Um, there's significant challenges now because treatment is often successful, but how does, how does the HR and how does the workforce re-engage and, and bring those people back in? Um, people are, are living longer, um, but they're being disabled by the treatment. So it's got very significant economic ramifications because they're not contributing to their pensions, they're not contributing to the overall costs um, that are associated with taxation in our society. The personal costs are significant, the treatment costs are significant, and the economic global community uh, costs are, are, are very uh, enormous as well. So more of us are going to get sick, more of us will live longer, um, and the cost of that treatment is spiralling. So you can see there's a big kind of economic. So what do we do about this? So um, one, of, one of my films, and, and actually the book is much better. I don't know if any of you have seen The Martian, um, but if you, if you have, go and read the book. It's much, much better. And for a science nerd guy like me, it's, it's brilliant. And one of the things that's, that's in the book, he's, he's basically left uh, isolated on, on Mars, uh, and he's going to have to wait 400 days before there's any hope of rescue, and he's got very little, so he has to you know, work out that kind of science thing. And we're kind of in a similar um, situation, so I, I kind of modify this as that we're going to have to research the shit out of this. That, that is the reality. We can all go out and do what we think is best, but unless we use research to guide our decisions and inform that, we are in danger of making some very costly um, uh, mistakes. And research is, is not just about doing the research, but it's about acting upon it. It's not just about publishing it, it's about bringing it into the things that we do. So uh, action research. So it's using data to make predictive models, to test our hypothesis and show improvement, whether that be in prevention, early detection, treatment efficacy, post-treatment and end-of-life care. Because each of those are ways that we can bring down that inexorable rise in the numbers terms of prevention, just to show some of the things that we do. Smoking kills um, five and a half thousand um, Irish people each year. It's responsible for many of the people that you deal with on, on, on a daily basis. Healthcare costs alone, um, direct healthcare costs, about 500 million. Um, and we talk about taxation, but actually the analysis shows that when you balance up taxation and, and, and the health impact, we're still 500 million euro short when you bring it all in together. Okay, so even with an expensive cost of <coughs> cigarettes, we still, from our pockets, have to find an extra 500 million euro to pay for, um, for, for that smoking. Typical cessation rates are unfortunately low. So somebody just decides um, to, to quit. It's about one in 20 um, there, thereabouts, depending on, on which papers, that's if you look after kind of three years. So going cold turkey or you know, getting Nicorette patches or uh, vaping or whatever, about one in 20. There are big impacts in that as well. You're much more likely to be able, you're, you're less likely to smoke if you come from a more affluent community. So just breaking down the socioeconomics, the smoking rate in poorer communities is twice that in, in uh, more wealthy communities. So this leads to, well, if you're putting your energy and effort in, you need to focus on those communities. So we have a program called We Can Quit, which was derived out of that kind of research. And it's an evidence-based 12-week supported program for women in poorer communities. 46% success rate. If you round the numbers, that means it's 10 times more effective than just people looking at something on the telly and saying, oh, I should quit smoking. People need a lot of support. Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances that, that we know of. Early detection is very important. I mentioned about, about Nick, um, so I won't spend too, too long on this. But we have a big uh, colorectal cancer problem um, in Ireland, very high um, death rate from it. Um, and we need to understand um, why that is and, and make better use of that test. Because just to put the economics aspects on, and this is CRUK um, figures, um, if colorectal cancer is caught early in stage one, nine in 10 people are cured, right? So, and often that may be with relatively um, uh, minor surgery. I mean, it'll be impactful for them, for them, but their life will go on and will be very normal. Um, Typical cost they calculate is 3,400 euro. Just that's pretty much just in the surgery. If they're caught in stage four, less than one in ten will be alive um, uh, at uh, five years. They will have gone through some fairly um, intense treatment, and just in drug treatment and, and surgery will have cost um, nearly four times um, that amount. New treatments we mentioned about um, ICORG and, and ICORG are constantly bringing and, and allowing patients access to, to new treatments. 
there are other areas, diet and in particular exercise um, can have a big impact and we, we had a great um, discussion around the, the importance of, of diet um, and that um, in, in the Cancer Society with the, the, the really great um, meeting there that you guys had um, last week, the week before. Um, but um, the impact of exercise, and exercise has been spoken about as the new drug in cancer. And this is just, um, I, and I suppose as research comes out, this number will, will kind of normalize a bit more. But the impact of uh, exercise in, in prostate cancer in this particular study, 40, 46% lower mortality. Now that wasn't all in terms of reduction of, of the growth of the tumor. People die from heart problems, strokes, uh, and a variety of other issues. Um, so an overall nearly halving of the mortality from prostate cancer in that study. Um, so we invest in a, a program um, in DCU called MedEx, um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of these programs around the country as well. Uh, it's getting uh, people often back to a greater stage of fitness than, than they had before they were ill. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the converted here when I'm bringing this slide up, but the impact of, of proper um, palliative resources and proper palliative care at an early enough stage in, in a, a patient's um, journey through cancer um, can have a huge impact in terms of their longevity and reduce the cost of treatment because they may not need to be on certain drugs, certain medications or certain other supports. So thanks for listening to my waffle and, 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 and going on. Hopefully you have a better understanding now of what it is that we do, what we've been investing in, and most importantly, where we hope to be in, in the next five to, to 10 years. Research has given great um, disease insight. We understand a lot about the basic biology of cancer now. Um, cancer numbers are unfortunately climbing, and we need to do a lot to try and bring control over that because we're not going to be able to afford that in, in, the, in the coming decades. We're simply not going to be able to treat our way out of this. Um, and research is really our only tool to guide this um, evolution of, of a sustainable, wealthy health future a future where we have some control over these things, where we get to live the maximum that our lives um, can, can, can ultimately give us. Um, and I suppose that, that vision then is to support that Irish research will inform optimal ways to ensure that Irish patients have least risk of getting cancer, best treatment if they do, and most hope of thriving afterwards. So thanks very much for your time.